A very good evening and a warm welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us this Sunday evening. Uh, this week, President Seveni announced that schools would further reopen for students of semi-candidate classes. So at the moment in schools, we have P7, S4 and S6. And now we're going to have P6, S3 and S5 joining them uh, starting from the 1st of March. And I think now is a good time to have the conversation that we're going to have tonight. We've all possibly heard of the word hysteria and it's, it's what took me to the conversation um, that we're about to start. And I remember that word constantly mentioned loosely a lot back in secondary school. So we're going to speak about it today and get a sense of how to protect our young learners even as they get back to school. My guests in the studio with me, I have Mrs. Helen Wataba, who is the headmistress of Toro Girls School. She traveled all the way from Toro at 6 a.m. this morning. Thank you so much for making the journey. It's a pleasure, Josephine, meeting you. Great, thank you. And on phone, we have Dr. Paul Nyende, who is a lecturer at Macquarie University School of Psychology. Dr. Nyende, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Well, Dr. Nyende would have joined us by you know, one of the, the online platforms, but of course we're still having a couple of challenges with the internet, and I think he's struggling on his, on his side, so we'll, he will use a phone call uh, for this particular conversation. Helen, you, you had an accident last year, and I'm sure your students were very worried about, about you, considering it happened during the period of the lockdown. What happened, and, and how are you doing? Yeah, I got an accident late September and my students were really worried. I got so many calls. Thank God I'm improving. And Josephine, I would like to say that if it wasn't for your show at one time, maybe I would be dead. I'm one of those people who never used to take fastening my belt seriously. But it's a time you hosted a young man, Kenneth by name, who lost a wife and a child in an accident. And I remember him stressing the need to always fasten our belts. And from that show, I would never relented. And if it wasn't for that show, maybe I would have had the pole that went through my hand. It would have gone through my chest, but thank God to the, the belt the that belt uh, held you back. I'm alive. My nerves are still recovering, but I know all will be well with time. Thank you so much. And I want to assure you, your show is relevant to us out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Mm. It's, it's good to get the feedback, and I'm, I'm glad you're, you're doing well um, from that. Um, how are you managing as an educator, you know, um, in this period of COVID-19, but also with this staggering return of students back to school? It has not been easy. Personally, I'm managing because I have a supportive staff. The kind of team that I work with is so focused and committed. And the parents are trying to, to cope. Our school is essentially funded by parents. It is stressful, but they are managing. It is not easy to run a school at quarter capacity. But we also want to keep the students in school. So we are happy that the president has released the rest. Mm -hmm. And we are eagerly waiting to receive them. You said something earlier that I had not really thought about. The mm -hmm. fact that our teacher is going to rest at any point. Um, maybe you could expound on that. No, we are wondering. We have been given a tentative program. Maybe they'll give us the rest periods. But when we are told that this year is going to end in July, we are also forcing our teachers going to mark after this period of exams. But they are the same teachers that we are depending on to teach the incoming sub-candidates. Yeah. So we shall figure it out maybe when we are given a final program okay mm -hmm. you, you've been in in this you've been an educator for over 30 years now yes, yes. and I want to get a sense as we get into a conversation of what that is like what is it like uh, when you think back on, on your 30 year journey the 30 year journey has been quite interesting and informative when it had just started it didn't seem to be easy I personally started during those hard times of 1986 when payment was not so so obvious and everyone looked at being a teacher as something as a last resort but then I realized that as you start interacting with young people it gets interesting because you realize you are forming a human being and seeing a child come in as a child and go out as a mature dependable 
person, you just feel so encouraged. And that's how I think I've stuck there for all these 30 years. It's now when you say 1986, I'm thinking about what, 34? Oh, it's, it's over 30, 30, 30 years. Yeah, over 34 years. Okay. Yes. Um, you, so in the 34 years, you've, you've been in mixed schools, single schools? The first, been the yes, the first 16 years were in purely boys' school. For 15 years, I was in Soga College, Mwiri. Well, two years in Jinja College. And then for eight years, I went uh, on promotion as a deputy head teacher in a purely girls school, that is Toro Girls. Then when I became a head teacher, I went for two years in a mixed school. Later on, I was posted back to Toro Girls, where I have been for the last eight years as a head teacher, so purely girls. So I have the experience for both boys and girls. Which one is easiest? Which one would you do again if you, if you had to pick? The boys are easier. Really? Yes. I, I find the girls to be so emotional. But again, being emotional has developed the other side of me. And I think that's the reason why I'm here. Okay. So let's get into our conversation. Yes. You oversee a single girls school. Yes. Um, I'd like you to speak to me about the experience there that relates to our conversation on hysteria. I remember when I was in school, I was in a single school for mm. a, a long time and people used to laugh at anybody who they even got a sense of, they could attach the word hysteria to. Mm. And now, uh, you know, when, when I'm speaking to you in our earlier conversation, I realize there's no fun in it, there's no games in it, it's, it's serious business. So, so speak to me about what that experience has been like for you. Okay, thank you, Josephine. Hysteria, surely even me, just like you, I used to take it as something so light, something to make fun about. But in my experience with girls, it is something deeper and something so serious. Even now in this time of COVID, we need to get so sensitive as we handle our girls in schools. When we talk about hysteria, some time back, maybe in the early 19s or 18s, it used to refer to especially young ladies who are going through highly emotional issues, excitability, something related to maybe s lack of sex or something, but it's, it's more than that. So from my experience, I've discovered that this hysteria among us girls is more caused by anxiety issues. We realize that girls, unlike boys, are so fearful, they are highly emotional, so many things put them to the wall. Things like too much pressure from the staff or the teachers, a lot of pressure from the parents, especially when it comes to performance, makes them get so scared. And at that age, when the brain is so pressurized, a lot happens within. And through these years, as I handled girls, I've come to realize, together with consultation with doctors, as we take these children even for medical consultation, you realize that it is their brain, and from what I understand, or from what I understood later on, is that that brain, since you cannot see that the brain is hurting, the brain tends to convert all that pressure, the fear, into something physical that you, the teacher, or the parent can be able to see. So those girls who are hysterical, are, they, the, the attacks are characterized by muscle spasms, inability to move the limbs, that is both the hands and the, or uncontrollable shakings, sometimes crying or, or even laughing for no reason, a lot of pain in the body. And eventually when that stress is too much, many other things come in. So it is something that we really need to take care of because it can even lead to death. I, I, I'm going to ask Dr. Nyende mm. to, to qualify our definition of it as hysteria. I, is that what it is, Dr. Nyende, um, what, what Helen is talking about? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Josephine. And uh, thank you, Helen, for that input. I think uh, she is very much on board. Uh, the girl child tends to be quite vulnerable to emotional issues. And uh, sometimes it may go far beyond 
into uh, manifesting itself as a physical condition. Uh, the hysteria might involve uh, physical changes, including paralysis of certain elements or parts of the body, as she has mentioned, or pain in the body and disorientation. So that's very correct. Helen, can you paint a picture for me using an experience from all your years of, of experience? Um, but even before you do that, have mm -hmm. you only noticed this in the girls' schools or is it also in the boys' schools? And is it actually more prevalent in the mixed schools or in the single-sex schools? Okay, thank you. I've had an experience mostly in the girls' school, but even when I was in the boys' school, mixed school, I realized that it was the girls who were always experiencing those issues. And I think the, ex the explanation here is that the boys are a bit strong emotionally. Even when they are vulnerable, they tend to put up a show. But the girls cannot stand any slight thing that scares them or makes them anxious. We we'll just hit them off. So it's more prevalent among us, the girls. W would you uh, describe for us an experience um, that you remember that you know comes to mind when we are having this conversation? Yes, I have had quite many, but I'll quote two. And then, okay, the two that have, I can quote have, were quite bright girls, very bright girls. When it came to performance, they were high achievers, above 80 to 100 percent, always. But then, emotionally, they were quite vulnerable. And these are children, whenever it came to examination time, they would be sick, they would faint, they would even fail to open their eyes, they would complain of headache, the chest would pain, In, instead of breathing they would heave as if they have an asthma attack. And then whatever treatment you gave, whether painkiller, they could not respond to painkillers. Even further medical examinations, nothing physical that a doctor could lay their hands on. But all the time it was sickness, a lot of pain, headache, sometimes even failure to speak, and a lot of as if fear, as if something is after them. And what was common amongst all these cases is that they were very bright children. And I kept wondering why only the bright children? I don't know whether the doctor can give us that explanation, but at a closer, on a closer look, and especially when I try to divulge in and get them closer, I realized that these are children who are scared of failing. To them, it was either excelling or nothing else. So each time the examination seems to be hard, or even just the thought of, of, the, exam. of the exam, for them they would go ahead and imagine that they, maybe they are going to fail. So that would just put them straight away into an attack. And then I, I imagine if you're uh, um, an exceptionally brilliant child, you, you have you the teacher's pet, so the teachers are looking at you. Your parents, uh, they can never understand you getting less than a 98 percent, you know, and so on. Dr. Nyende, do you want to come in at this point? Oh, yes. Um, indeed, what I'm talking about uh, has a lot of weight. Uh, it stands back in the socialization of the girl child. Uh, we tend to often encourage the girl child to experience emotion. And uh, this is what makes the girls emotional. And later on, they appear as well do tend to encourage the same. So they propel the issue forward. While for the boy child, we tend to help them see for the experience of emotion, especially the tender emotions like sorrow, like sadness, and anxiety, etc. We often want the boy to be firm enough and strong enough to face his world and his challenges as a man. So that's where it begins. And uh, quite often your friends as boys would not allow you to experience his emotions. So because the girls are allowed to go through the tender emotions, these become part of their way of relating to the world. Unfortunately, this predisposes the girl to 
depression and other emotional issues. And uh, that can form the background of serious mental issues like hysteria and the conversion disorder where it becomes physical. So it tells us that we must put a lot of emphasis on the mental well-being of the girl child. We must see to it that we train the girl to be able to uh, be well and face their day-to-day events without feeling overwhelmed. Dr. Nyande, I, I, I strongly believe also that um, the, the boy child that is constantly told be strong, you know, act like a man and, and so on, eventually it also damages mm. them. But in keeping to this conversation on, on hysteria and the girls, um, Helen has mentioned uh, not once, not twice, that it's, she finds that it is the girls who are brilliant in, in school, who are doing well, um, performing well academically. Do you want to, to speak to that? Oh, yes. I think uh, a person who is doing well may experience a lot of anxieties, depending on how you set your goals. If you believe that you can't set up for a second position and that you must be the best in the class, mm. it can have significant impact on you later. Because when you feel like you have not prepared well enough, you are likely to see yourself as a failure. And uh, you begin to panic and then anxiety takes over. Mm. So uh, those who have very high standards, who are actually doing well, can actually turn out to be even more vulnerable depending on how they interpret failure. Somebody may see a second position in a class or a servant as a failure. True. And uh, that works very much against power. I'm, I'm, I'm nodding because vigorously, Dr. Nyende, you can't see me because I know somebody like that who, mm. who wants to be the first in class, so she has to be there at 6 a.m. even before the, the, the gate man opens the, sure. the gate because, you know, even that sure. is, a, is a position she must attain. All right, let's take a short break and we'll be right back uh, with, to continue this conversation. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. We're coming to you from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, the NTV Uganda Studios. In the studio with me is Mrs. Helen Wataba, who is the headmistress of Tororo Girls School. And joining us on phone is Dr. Paul Nyende, who is a lecturer at Macquarie University School of Psychology. Before we took a break, we were speaking about um, how the, the overly bright students are the ones who usually fall in, in this category of people who struggle with hysteria. And I, I want to know, we're telling parents, don't push the child too much. How do you strike a balance, um, f from your perspective, uh, Helen, with read and try to excel, but don't overdo it to the point of it breaks you? OK, as teachers, definitely we, we really push. And it is these experiences that are trying to shape us to to also look at the other side and what we are deciding these days is to help these children to set goals but set realistic goals and then to try and balance their lives not to have this kind of child who is just w loop sided on books and there's no life the other side no games no exercise no work but just books and sometimes we get a problem when it is the other side of the parent because a parent believes my child must be maybe a scientist. In our family, we are engineers. <laughs> so when a child tries to show the other side, it becomes a problem. So as teachers, we do our part, but sometimes we get a problem. With because the parents. Yes, the parents, they believe children should be in a certain line, which maybe they themselves never... Arts Actually. children have suffered, children who lean heavily to, to the arts. Yes. Dr. Nyende, do you want to speak to that, um, to a parent or a child who is listening and also to a teacher who is listening about striking a balance in the expectations they have of 
themselves or of the children? Yes, thank you. I think uh, a good education is an all-round education, and that also non-academic activities are very essential in uh, success of a child. For example, social skills and uh, learning to live with others and teamwork, communication skills, and so forth. So. Well, unfortunately, we have parents who are only focused on the academic achievement. Mm. And uh, we receive some of these students at the university who have no skill elsewhere and have challenges in managing interpersonal relations. So I would think that uh, for a healthy development, we need to see that it's an all-round education we don't want to push academics 100% because it becomes frustrating and sometimes uh, the children find it aimless and uh, stressing, full of anxiety. Some can take academic pressure while some may be vulnerable and break down and ultimately drop out. Yeah. So we need to leave some space, yes. I think one of the things that Helen mentioned at a point, um, Dr. Nyende, was the physical, the, the your brain sort of making this out to you and then it becomes like a full-blown illness. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I remember the, a friend of mine, her daughter gets extreme eczema. She, she, she gets extreme eczema while she's in school, but during this lockdown period, she's been surprisingly okay is, is, and she's, she's really brilliant. Is this something that we can point to that as well, uh, Dr. Nyende? Yes, I think it depends upon the child and uh, the atmosphere at school. Sometimes children uh, feel threatened by the school environment. Mm. This may be from the academic pressure, or it might be the social dynamics within the school. Remember issues of bullying that may even come to the attention of administration. So school may not be as safe as one would expect, and uh, it might do quite some harm to the child. But of course it depends on the kind of child and how they have been raised. If they have developed a pattern of hardness, they may be able to save through the child without difficulty. And there are those who are very soft on the inside that will all crumble. All right. Um, I, I think that it's, it's important for us, thank you, Dr. Nyende, to, to also speak about the physical that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I remember in school we had some of the people that would, you know, someone would come screaming, hey, so-and-so has hysteria, mm -hmm. she's just fainted, and then, you know, people go and Tired. circle <laughs> around her, try to carry her to the sick bay, but they're laughing and all. Do you still have incidents like that in school? Okay, many schools are still experiencing that. Personally, I thank God because of what I went through, some of it with my own children and other children along the years, that in the past years, at least in our school, it has come down because of the interest I got in, it, in that subject, reading a lot about it and then sensitizing, first of all, the staff who handle the children, and then the children to keep assuring them, like Dr. Nyende is saying, telling them that this is all about the brain work. Yeah. Because why I got so intre I mean, touched by this subject is that when, whenever it happens in schools, head teachers have been accused of, of witchcraft. I don't know whether <laughs> you have heard of that. Yes, I have. <laughs> yes. So you wonder, you know, when children get an attack, and when it is a girl's school, you can even have mass hysteria because fear is contagious. So it has happened where you have had in a certain school, the whole of P6, and you know your reality is either P6, senior four, senior three, not S1, not P1, not P2, not P3. So when so many children attack like that and they go in that frenzy, in some schools you'll hear they call it Calypso disease eh, because they are shaking and the rest of it. So we are choose do we head teachers of bringing witchcraft so that we can make children pass. And you know now you find that it is the bright children again who are under attack. So many by the head teachers have been traumatized. So 
that's what bring, really gets to my heart because as head teachers we don't go into witchcraft but if we're out there <laughs> people are to understand <laughs> that these are issues to do with the mental health of the yeah. adult children all of us would join hands as a society together which are chooses us and our fellow teachers and even the children to know themselves and be able to manage our mental health and uh, our goals. Uh, Dr. Nyende, <laughs> do, do you want to speak to that if it is witchcraft uh, yes. or not? <laughs> I think uh, I found uh, Helen a very interesting uh, teacher. And, uh, from what she said, she was very experienced and uh, taking an interest in that area that many have ignored. The hysteria has been interpreted as witchcraft because today here in Africa, mm -hmm. if we do not understand any complex phenomenon, we resign and refer to it as witchcraft. And therefore, we do not handle the situation appropriately, nor do we even explore to find an explanation to what is wrong. So we don't even take appropriate steps. I think a sensitized head teacher like Helen is uh, with the teachers sensitized as well, will deal with the problem and have that issue reduced greatly in their school, ultimately becoming a model school. I think these problems have been growing, and the media uh, has made a very big case of them, unfortunately, and uh, yet they are psychological issues, and <laughs> emotional problems are contagious, and the others, and especially the girls of this age, to be vulnerable to anxiety and hysteria. Right. Dr. Nyende, Helen mentioned not once, not twice, that the episodes are usually common in the third term, I yes. think. So that's when you're transitioning yep. from one class to the Promotion. other. Promotion. Yeah. Yes. That's the time when the evidence is at uh, its highest. When exams are coming close, uh, it is very threatening for the young ones, and besides, uh, pressure might be coming from home in that uh, we want you to be the first. We want you to be among the best. And you don't see how you're going home with a bad report. Therefore, uh, if you're still a child, remember that. You don't yet have the capability to handle the kind of pressures that others face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, being away from home sometimes also is another factor. I remember one case of a child who experienced serious conversion problems, fainting and, uh, you know, losing consciousness. And later it was found out that she had been sent to one of the traditional schools where they did not permit growing hair. Having been in a private primary school, she was allowed to grow her hair. And the uh, secondary school does not allow that. So that seemed to be the core of her frenzy. When she was withdrawn from the school and went to where they allowed her, everything settled. I, I mean, we're laughing about it, Dr. <laughs> Nyande, because it feels like just hair. But I think oh if you can just explain how serious it is, you know, even the little thing like hair, how serious it is to a parent or a teacher or a head teacher who is listening, and also, maybe it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to explain why we need yeah. to have um, counselors in schools for mm. whom yeah. this would be an area that they would come in and, and give some help. Uh, yes, I think it's a very simple thing, but very complex for the child. Uh, depending on the home they have been raised in, if they have been earlier uh, pampered and in... Uh, private school where they are allowed to carry electronic devices and uh, grow their hair. They have been told you cannot carry your own clothes. You must be like everyone else. And uh, they feel that is an attack on them. They feel, uh, you know, uh, it's unacceptable to them. They are so angry. While their friends went to other places where they are allowed to carry these devices, they feel they are, they are trapped. It's like incarceration. So they need to be prepared for the transition from the primary to the secondary. And depending on what kind of secondary school it is, we also need to have uh, counselors who help them settle into the school, given their earlier primary attitudes. So you may get some cases like that 
and they will be troubling you and you don't exactly know why this is happening. Yeah. Helen, do you do you have a counselor in your school, for example? Okay, the, we the budget cannot allow, but we have teachers whom we appoint who, whose Lord has taken care of them being counsellors, and children feel free to go to such people. But then in our s school, we have an, a system of where a teacher has twenty five students as family members, okay. so. Amongst maybe the six to so four of us, each one gets some 25, and that's your family. So besides the class teacher, a house teacher, we also have family heads. I also have children who, who call me mommy. And through those smaller groups, we have been able to bring the children closer and have them counseled. And we also encourage them to approach teachers whom they feel they are most comfortable with. So we don't have those issues where people still keep things to themselves but it has come up as a result of the experience of the school being accused of having is it demons or what or because which people did not <laughs> not really de <laughs> saying that they are demons but yeah. just because people did not understand and because I was interested in that issue sensitization has helped and bre breaking ourselves into those small groups has brought children closer and sort of solved those, some of those extreme uh, I, I issues. I like what you're doing in, in giving the, the ch students, you know, f sort of family units mm. where they can, they can go. But mm. it feels like a school has too many children and too few teachers. True. So to be able to, to strike that balance. And uh, Dr. Nyende, I don't know what you would say about schools having counselors. I know that we know that in, in more developed countries, a school will have a school mm. counselor that is stationed there to, to meet students at that point, you know, where they need that kind of support. What, what, what would you say about our schools here and what can we do where we cannot take on Helen's approach? Uh, thank you. I, I think uh, having a school counselor is the ideal situation. Somebody who only takes the role of counselor and does not do any teaching yeah. Uh, but, of course, it has implications on the budget, and uh, sometimes we may not have uh, somebody to fill up the post. A few schools do have uh, a counselor on the establishment, and they have that extra skill. But those who haven't got that opportunity, because the budget does not allow, the establishment has not been changed, they could train the teachers giving them some additional specialized training and counseling and uh, in-service training, depending on the problem that they have encountered in school, or have a visiting counselor come once in a while from the outside. But I very much like the family systems approach that uh, Helen is using in the school. I think it is very, very helpful, and the other approach take that example where you have smaller groups that have a teacher who may refer to as parents and they can approach that teacher whenever they have issues. You get to know them better and resolve issues early in time. All right. Very wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nyende. Let's take another short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for mm -hmm. staying with us. Uh, we, we left off on a, you know, I'm, I was still curious about this system that you have in your school with mm -hmm. the family, the, the little families that you, mm -hmm. you formulate. What if I don't like uh, the <laughs> teacher you assign me as my family? Yes, it has happened. We try to encourage them that in life you don't choose a parent. So we encourage them to give an opportunity to that teacher to, to parent or mentor them. But sometimes some of them are quite stubborn. When it is, we have a, shed, a schedule for meeting our families. It is every after three weeks because we have also other meetings. So what some of those children do, they, they tend to walk away and fluke other family <laughs> meetings. So it is interesting. <laughs> All right, do, do you, is, is there 
um, are the teachers trained to be able to counsel these, these students? Is there any kind of training that, that is given? Okay, whenever there are some either organizations or the government sometimes has programs to, in-service programs to add some skills to senior women teachers or those in charge of counseling, we ensure that our teachers go for such. Okay. Then sometimes we also have our own staff development programs organized by the school administration where we equip ourselves, we're also mentored okay. and we get improve, we improve on our skills. All right. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Nyende, things like this, would they be, uh, and not, not the counseling, but just speaking to hysteria as a whole, could we place it as one of the reasons children are leaving one school? I'm assuming that mm. if, you know, you have, you know, these episodes of mass hysteria in a school, then a child goes home and says, ah, ah we have demons, demons at school, you know, change me. Or kids are jumping from school to school, and I, gu I guess that can be quite destabilizing. Uh, yes, I think uh, if a child came home and talking about demons and uh, uh, things of that nature, I think sometimes it's very threatening for uh, parents, and they need to make uh, changes without really uh, carefully analyzing. That's you know, our society is not very, very sensitized on uh, public issues. We still have a lot of work to do. Uh, teachers also need to access parents and regular parents to explain the number of uh, psychological phenomena because they have the background and the program as well. Uh, so they can get parents involved. Otherwise... Dr. Nyende, I'm struggling to hear you. I, I just need to check if if it's just me on my side. All right, uh, we'll try to get Dr. Nyende to, to join the conversation again. Um, Helen, we're about to close. Mm. I, I want to hear from you what you think the effect of hysteria is long term on mm. the students and what you are doing, what you want other parents to do. Yes, thank you. And Joseph. teachers. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, if this con anxiety conversion disorder is not understood, it has a, a big impact on the children. One, they lose their esteem because they are always the ones who are off, who are maybe mistaken to, to be attacked. So they lose their esteem. We have actually had children who have dropped out of school because no one has understood them. Uh, I remember one time I kept one in my house for a whole year because the parents had said, let her die. And then the rest of the school was saying, why is she keeping that one? Is it because she's so bright? And, you know, there was that bit of it. Nobody understood. But I knew that this child was okay, just needed to psychotherapy, which nobody was willing to give because it's quite time-consuming. Did that child ever go back to the parents who said, let her die? When, the, the, she, when eventually she sat, and she was even the best in the whole school, even after being like that for a whole year. So she went back and she's still struggling. Unfortunately, she decided to join another school. I think she went to... Who did not know her, her issue. So she was in and out. Oh, she cool. essentially studied for three months in the two years of A-level. Somebody who, who joined with it, with it 10 or what, ended up getting very low points because nobody understood. And right now she's struggling to take an, a certificate course. But this is somebody who wanted to be a surgeon. And she had the capacity. So it can be as bad as that. So my appeal to the parents out there is that not everything that you don't understand is, is demonic. You have heard from our doctor, Nyende, who's a psychiatrist, that this is something to do with the mental issues and the emotional weaknesses of the girl child, we need to give them a chance. Where you cannot understand, it's good to seek referral. And for the teachers out there, we need to be patient, we need to listen, and we need to use encouraging words. Sometimes we push these children so much the wall. We put, even as a teachers, we put certain marks. If you don't score a 60, they ask. So no wonder the third term is yeah. really tight. So we also need to adjust and maybe the way we communicate our goals to the parents there, you need to 
be supportive to the girl children. They have a lot of potential. Sometimes we only think about the sexual abuse, but emotionally they need a lot of support. Right. Thank you very mm. much, Mrs. Helen, mm. uh, uh, for, for sharing that with us. Dr. Nyende, I know that you're back online, and yes. I, I wanted you to close us off. I'd asked Helen to share the long-term effects she thinks this has on the students, and she just shared a story. I don't know if you were able to catch that, but I would like to get your point yes. of view on, on the long-term effects and then a way forward for the students, the parents, and the educators um, who do not have the experience or even the vision that Helen has? Right. I think uh, hysteria or emotional problems will have a significant impact on you know, the psychological well-being of the child and uh, therefore can hinder their potential to succeed as the case raised by Helen, potential to reach uh, their goals because they are not helped. Uh, parents are not aware of what is going on and are moving from school to school rather than dealing directly with the problem. Yeah. Uh, I encourage parents to uh, get to understand their children better and communicate more effectively and work closely with the teachers so that we can have a functional child so that we don't have children drop out and uh, fail to get uh, to their goal. But I also thank Helen, and I would say finally that uh, I wish all teachers like Helen. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I really do. I wish the same as well. Dr. Nyende, before you go, <laughs> just speak briefly. You touched a bit on, on bullying, and I know it's a big factor um, in yeah. schools, and we don't talk about it enough. Could you just speak briefly on, on bullying and the emotional effect on, on students? I, 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 I know it happens a lot, yeah. but we just tend to sweep it under the rug. So yeah. if you could just close with that. Sometimes it happens in a more subtle way. There is no physical attack. But uh, it is emotional, uh, being excluded from the group, uh, being called names, and can devastate the child will have significant impact on their esteem and growth and development. It could also make them lose confidence in themselves, and hence they will not realize their potential because of the hostile environment. It may go on and noticed by the school uh, and parents as well because humiliated, talk about it, but the regular esteem is uh, accepted. So head teachers need to go down and uh, inquire in a more friendly way and then to access this information and support those who are affected and deal with this with those who engage in the bullying. All right. Well, uh, students are going back to school. Some of them are already in school. What is your, your final word to them, Dr. Nyende, and then I'll come to you, uh, Helen. What, is, what would you like to tell them, considering the period that we've been in COVID-19, the emotional stress, now they're getting into exams. I, I'm sure it's a load on their shoulders. Yeah. Maybe they don't even see it like that, but a, at a point it weighs heavily down on you. What would you like to say to them? I think uh, they should expect quite a lot of pressure on them uh, because of having been home for long and uh, also the challenges of uh, COVID-19 scare. They also need to uh, get accurate information and to consult with the teachers wherever they need to within. They need to help uh, who are responsible. Thank you very much, Dr. Nyende, for taking the time to speak with us. I know that you had engagements, but you made the time, and I thank you very much for always doing that. Thank oh, you. Okay. All right. Uh, Helen, in closing, I just want to hear from you very quickly. The kids are coming back to school. Um, what plan do you have to, well, number one, keep them safe, but to also keep them mentally um, safe as well, um, looking at all the challenges that we've had? What is your plan? What are you telling your teachers? What are you telling other teachers out there? Okay, thank you. For the students, we really welcome them back and want to encourage them to, to live a day at a time because not all of, only them that have lost time, the whole country has lost time, maybe the whole world. Yeah. So if you take it to yourself, we can hardly break down. And for the teachers, it's just an encouragement that we, ha we shall do what we have to do 
because in the they have told us our academic year is going to end in July, and now I don't know for the four months really what can we cover. We shall be able to cover what we can. Some people are thinking of adjusting timetables beginning at 5 a.m., but that Ooh. will also put pressure yeah, that's, that's so much mode, yeah. on that. But right now with the candidates, exact, that's what we have been going through. So we just have to prepare psychologically. I believe a prepared mind can be able to handle. Thank you very much. Yes. That's a good note to leave us. Mm. Thank you, mm. uh, Helen, for taking the time and traveling yes. all the way from Toro to yes. come and, and share this conversation with yes. us. I greatly appreciate it. And that brings us to the end of our show for tonight. Thank you for watching. Coming up is NTV Weekend Edition.